So let's now revisit the velocity problem. Just recall that the average velocity of a moving particle is its displacement divided by its time. Displacement, the difference between where it started and where it ended on the time interval, and divided by the length of that time interval. So more precisely, let's suppose we have an object moving along a straight line according to an equation of motion s equals f of t. So in other words, at any given time, we can figure out exactly what its position is, where its position is the displacement of the object from the origin at time t. So we've got this axis here, this s axis, and maybe there's a origin somewhere on it. So this is our s axis and some frame of reference on this axis and the particles moving along it. Um, by the way, leave a little bit of space over here because we're going to look at a different interpretation of this using a coordinate grid. So just leave some room for that. What do we have? Well, the particle at some time is somewhere. So maybe at time A, there's where the particle is. So that's our position at time A. What about a little bit later, maybe h time units later? So maybe it's somewhere over here. That's f of a plus h. So that's the position at time a plus h. And we can do things like, well, OK, now I can figure out its displacement. What's the difference between where it started at time A and where it ended at A plus H? That's the displacement. So that's what we mean by displacement. And we have this particle then that's sort of moving around on the S axis. Its position is always given by the function F. So whatever time you want to figure out where it is, you plug it into the function F, it gives you the position. There's another way to look at this, and that is by explicitly um, sketching the relationship between uh, t and s as the function y equals f of t, or s, sorry, s equals f of t. And we can put the same sort of bits of information at some time a, here's the position of the particle, so you can read off its corresponding position on the s axis, and then a little while later, it's somewhere over here, there's h units later, that's a plus h somewhere over here. And what can we do here? Well, I want to make some sort of interpretation of what this ratio is. Displacement over time. Well, displacement is just the difference in the initial position versus the final position. So displacement is just this distance here. That's the displacement. What's the time elapsed? Well, the time elapsed is just how long it took to go from time A to A plus H. And that's H here, so that's our time. Maybe I'll indicate it here that that is H. So what is displacement over time? Well, displacement over time is this was A plus H, S of A plus H, that's that point. And this point was A, S of A. So our displacement is s of a plus h minus s of a, and our time is h. So it's the slope of this secant line. The slope of this secant line is the average velocity. Slope of the secant. And so that's what we've written down here. I've used s in place of the function name. I probably should have used f. Um, sometimes we default to just using s as the name of the function, but maybe I'll be more explicit here. So our function was really f in this case. So what we have is that the average velocity can be interpreted as the slope of the secant line through those two points. So the big question is, what if h is small? What if h is small? We take h to be closer and closer and closer to zero. Here we're just measuring displacement over at smaller time intervals. We expect the slope of the secant lines for h to be small to approach the instantaneous velocity of the object. And that's what we're going to define. The instantaneous velocity 
or the velocities for short, of the object at time t equals a is the limiting value of the average velocities. It's the limiting value of the average velocities as you take the time interval smaller and smaller and smaller. That limiting value of the average velocities is what we call the instantaneous velocity. We've already seen that we can interpret these average velocities as slopes of secant lines. So you can interpret the instantaneous velocity as the slope of the tangent line. The instantaneous velocity will be the slope of the tangent line to the position function at the point in question. So here's the, here's the key. This is the derivative of the position function at t equals a. And we have that notation that says, well, it's just, if we call the position function s, or f as we've done above, it's going to be s prime of a. So the instantaneous velocity is a derivative. That's the key here. It's the same problem, tangent line problem, velocity problem. They both point to this idea of they're both the derivative. They're both the derivative of the function under consideration. So let's look at some examples. If an arrow is shot upwards on the moon with a velocity of 58 meters per second, its height after t seconds is given by this expression. So this tells us the height at a given time. This is the position function. It tells us the height at a given time. So it's the position measured relative to, I guess, the ground from where it was launched. Find the velocity of the arrow when t equals a. This is the key. What is velocity? You know position. What is velocity? Velocity is the derivative, derivative of the position at a. Okay, so h prime at a is defined to be the limit as h goes to zero of h of a plus little h minus h, big H of little a all over little h. Now let's pop in everything. So this is 58 a plus h minus 0 0.83 times a plus h all squared minus the function at a, 58a minus the minus 0 0.833, so that's a plus 0 0.8, sorry, 83, uh, a squared, a squared all over h. Okay, so this may look like uh, a complicated mess that you've got to sort out, but the key is to be able to decide what you need to do. When I plug h equals 0 in it, I get 0 over 0. I know why the bottom's going to 0, because of the h there. The top's going to 0 because there's actually a hidden factor of an h in there. It's a polynomial. The only way a polynomial can vanish is a polynomial in h. The only way it can vanish at 0 is if h was a factor of it. So h has to be a factor of the numerator. So I need to find that. So I'm going to use a little bit of algebra to try to get that h to show itself. So this becomes 58a plus 58h minus, so now I can expand this out, a plus h all squared is an a squared plus a 2ah plus an h squared, but then I also have to multiply each of those three terms by the negative 0.83a squared minus so 2 times 0 0.83 is the 1.66, 1, 1 and that's multiplied by the ah cross term, minus 0 0.83h squared, minus the 58a, that's there, plus the 0 0.83a squared, all over h, and now I'm happy because look, 0 0.83a squared cancels with a 0 0.83a squared, the only other thing that doesn't have an h in it is this 58a. That 58a cancels with this 58a because of the minus sign in front of the, the second one. Now I've got all of those things cancelled. The only things surviving in the numerator have h factors in them. So I can divide that into each one of them. 
and I get the limit as h goes to 0 of 58 minus 1.66a minus 0.83h. As h goes to 0, the last term goes to 0, the other two terms survive, and so we're left with a limit of 58 minus 1.66a. So the velocity at a is 58 minus 1.66a. We found our velocity function. And the next question says, when will the arrow hit the moon? Okay, so you launch the arrow up, it goes up, it comes back down. When does it hit the moon? Well, assuming that you shot it upwards on the moon, so you're standing on the moon, when it comes back to the moon means when it lands at the same height it was launched from. And so we're really interested in when the height is zero. When is the height zero? When is this zero? Well, that's zero when 58t minus 0.83t squared is zero. And that I can factor out a t from. And so this product is zero when precisely one of the terms, or one of the factors, is zero. So that's either when t is zero, or when 58 minus 0.83t is zero. When t is zero, well that's when it was launched. So it was launched from height zero, so we expect to get that as an answer. When it's going to hit again is this other solution, when t is non-zero. So the other solution would be t being 58 over 0 0.83. And that's approximately 69.9 seconds. So what we have is that when will the arrow hit the moon? It will hit the moon. approximately 69.9 seconds after it was launched. So after it was launched. What's the next question? With what velocity will the arrow hit the moon? With what velocity will the arrow hit the moon? Well, we know when it will hit the moon. I wrote the approximation here, 69.9, but there's the exact value, 58 over 0 0.83. At time 58 over 0 0.83, that's when it hits the moon. I want to know what the velocity is at that time. I have a formula for velocity, so I just need to work out v at 58 over 0 0.83. And so that's 58 minus 1.66 times 58 over 0 0.83. That's 58 minus, remember 0 0.83 um, times 2 is the 1.66, so this is really 2 times 58. And so the resulting velocity is negative 58 meters per second. Why negative? Well, remember the arrows coming down the arrows coming down the height at which the or the height of the arrow at a time at a given time is decreasing as it's falling so as the height is decreasing the slope of the tangent line or its derivative should be negative so this indicates that it's moving downwards the velocity is 58 meters per second downwards its speed, if you want to think um, in terms of what the difference between speed and velocity is, the speed of the arrow is 58 meters per second. Speed does not take into consideration direction. The velocity does take direction into consideration. So the velocity is negative 58 meters per second. The speed, we would say, is 58 meters per second. So here we saw how the velocity is related to the derivative. In the part four of this lecture, in the next video, we're going to look at how derivatives crop up in rate of change problems in other areas of science.